And we're here today with Mike Darby, the founder of Bristol Archive and Sugar Shack Records, uh, who was to thank for the recent revival of Bristol's reggae scene from the 70s and 80s. Uh, so, to begin, where did you grow up, Mike? Uh, I'm from uh, Frampton Cultural, which uh, you could probably say is predominantly white middle class. So it's quite a weird thing for me to be obsessed with reggae music, but um, yeah, I'm Bristolian through and through. Okay. So how did you first get into reggae? How were you introduced? Uh, I was in a, a white kind of reggae ska band uh, in 1979 called The Rim Shots, and um, we played... Um, with the beat and the body snatchers, uh, Hazel O'Connor, but we released our first single on Shockwave Records. Shockwave Records um, was a label that was based in Eastern, um, which concentrated on primarily black artists, uh, and we were the kind of first single release from an out of the community type project. Um, we, had a, we had Gene Walsh as our manager. Um, and um, it, you know it was a very exciting time. So you know the reggae, the whole Bristol reggae thing. Uh, although Gene didn't ever work with Black Roots and Talisman, he had Joshua Moses on his label. So that's how I met Josh. Okay, okay. Um, so could you let us know a little bit about how common and how well received reggae was in Bristol in the seventies? Was it listened to by most people? By a lot of people. I, I remember uh, vividly going to gigs. Uh, and you could, in all seriousness, go to three gigs every night of the week um, and just pop in and check one band on whatever billing. Um, and the reggae bands had massive power in terms of they, they pulled loads and loads of people effortlessly, and they were almost, in my kind of head, the kind of kings of the whole Bristol music scene in the late 70s and the early 80s. Um, so, for example, Black Roots could play the Colson Hall. Um, yeah, OK, they might have some funding from the Arts Council, but they would headline the Colson Hall, they could play the Anson Rooms at Bristol University. Um, so, compared to most local bands, the reggae bands were on a much grander kind of level. Br Bristol Archive Records is exactly what it says on the tin. It, it, it releases music from 1977 onwards. So, you know, it starts with the Cortinas and the Pigs, so it goes from punk to post-punk. And I, I, I'm, I put together a, um, a brilliant compilation album called Bristol the Punk Explosion, which didn't sell very well. In fact, it's, you know, it's lost money. But the packaging was brilliant. The, the, the quality of the music was fantastic. Um, and when I was when I was growing up, um, I used to support Black Roots and Talisman and, and, and think that they were incredible and they should have gone on and had major record deals. And... You know, I obviously was aspiring to be a pop star and, and um, try and get a major record deal. And, and I always wanted to put a record out, which to me symbolised what it was like in town in 1980. And in town in 1980, the big bands were Black Roots and Talisman, but they didn't ever play together. I think they only played together once. And they certainly would never, ever have entertained the idea of being on a record together. So to put a compilation together where they agreed to participate with, with other artists and, and pull off what is now, you know, Bristol Reggae Explosion, 1978 to 1983, uh, was, was just a dream, really, um, and, it, and, it, and it fell into place quite, quite easily. Uh, so we hear you're about to embark on a new project uh, with a new label, so the Reggae Archive Records. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, Reggae Archive Records um, seemed like a natural progression uh, from the success with Bristol Reggae because uh, obviously there'll, there'll come a point where there, there will be no more archive reggae recordings uh, so the whole thing will dry up so rather than just stop um, we kind of dreamt up um, a plan whereby we could seamlessly move into other cities but rather than create another archive label in another city we'd actually brand the whole label as Reggae Archive Records with the with the intention of discovering, uh, exactly in the same way that we've, we've done it with Bristol, discovering um, British reggae that perhaps was released in limited quantities or was lost for whatever reason and didn't achieve perhaps what it could have done. Um, we're really, really uh, excited about what the potential is for that label uh, because we've, got, we've basically got a deal already with Fashion Records, which is... Um, I think I'd be, you know, right to say that the third biggest label in the UK uh, in the 80s behind Trojan and Greensleeves. Um, so we've got access to their catalogue. 
so we've got London. London's come to Bristol, which never happens normally, so that's good. Uh, and we've got an, an, a release from Tribes Man from London, 1978, and then we've got an album in October from Eclipse, who are from Birmingham. So we've got a good start. I mean, there's loads of work involved with that because it's a lot easier for me to track down people in Bristol when I know a lot of people, whereas when you're dealing with people in Birmingham, you haven't got the faintest idea what you're doing. But, um, you know, we're trying hard. I think, I think it's, it's an underground, almost obsessive thing, which to a lot of people is their culture, and to a lot of people they become fascinated by that culture, uh, and therefore they kind of move towards it, and it sucks you in, and, and, and you can't kind of escape the baseline. Now, I think where Bristol fits into that is that Bristol is probably, or should be acclaimed as like the base capital of the world because Bristol from late 70s right through the 80s into the 90s and now has always been massive on bass so you know the fact that people are back into dub you know dub sells um, it's just a natural progression of all the other different styles of music and that and that probably is what your film's going to be about <laughs>